Welcome to Coach's Corner with several of the top trail running coaches in the world, Chris Emel, David Roach, and Ian Sharman. The list of their accomplishments has athletes would fill the entire episode, so I'll leave it to you to find them on the web and read their incredible biographies. But we'll start with each of them giving us a quick self-introduction. Chrissy, let's start with you. Hi, good morning, I guess afternoon. Uh, my name is Chrissy, and I live in Bellingham, Washington. Actually, I live in the state of Washington. I have my little mobile office and cruise around a lot, and my primary focus with coaching athletes is newbies, people that are finding the sport for the first time and super curious about what they can do and how much further they can push themselves. And I guess my biggest statement is watching them turn the impossible to possible. That's like my moment as a coach. That's a, it's a t-shirt too. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else already owns that, but I like it. <laughs> and, do they? and David. Hi guys. I'm the, my name's David Roach coach at some work, all play running team. Um, with my wife, Megan, who just became a doctor. You're releasing this later, but um, so it helps to have her expertise uh, lifting up the average. Um, and we coach runners of all abilities through that. Ian? I'm Ian Sharman. Um, I've got the different accent. I'm from the UK, but uh, I've been coaching since about 2010. I started Sharman Ultra then, and I've got a whole bunch of other coaches and specialists, including people like Ellie Greenwood, Liza Howard, Zach Bitter, Magda Boule. Um, and we coach really every type of mainly ultra runner, but also endurance running. And several of us have a, a particular specialty in 100 milers. Excellent. And I'm Sean Bearden, host of Science of Ultra. I'm a university professor and exercise physiologist. And each of these episodes is intended to highlight a specific topic relevant to all trail runners. We start in the form of a true-false statement, get a one-word answer for each, uh, from each uh, coach on which direction they're leaning, and then discuss the nuances that make the real answer less clear. Ultimately, the purpose is to provide you with information that you can apply to your own training. And so we begin, our true-false for today is performance metrics are important for optimizing outcomes. We started with Chrissy. Let's go back around that circle. Chrissy, what do you say to that? I didn't, I'm suddenly not hearing you. My answer is false. There we go. David. True. And Ian. True. Yay. All right. Not unanimous. That's good. <laughs> that means we get to find more room in the middle. I like that. Well, okay. So Chrissy, why false? I chose false and I actually made an answer when we were talking or discussing on email earlier and I know there is a, tr a lot of truth to it and I would call it more of a fuzzy gray area I chose false to I was guessing that everybody else would be true <laughs> I really believe that a lot that comes to the the end result or pro maximizing performance output is mindset and a lot of that doesn't really happen in the miles that we put I mean I guess it happens while we're putting the miles in but the like physical component of mileage versus visualization taking time to prepare yourself uh, I'm a big like making a packing list or a schedule to get yourself the best set so all of the com I think there's so much more to it than just what happens physiologically and the mind is a big part of it so that's why I put the fuzzy false in there okay great Davis wh David where's the truth in this so for me, I'm kind of also in between, but it's in a slightly different direction than you might assume with performance metrics. So for me, I think performance metrics are amazing to ensure that someone doesn't do too much. Um, I don't care about them so much to quantify intensity or upper end performance. I care much more about quantifying lower end performance and um, you know, kind of keeping a check on maybe uh, some of the more compulsive or ambitious impulses that many runners have, especially many ultra runners have. So, you know, I love heart rate monitors, don't love them for workouts. I love, you know, quantifying total workload. I don't really care about where in the intensity bands that workload exactly is. I care a lot more about the feel of that. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of both. Obviously I think it is for all of us. Um, and it really varies on the athlete, like some athletes, um, a good example is, let's say, Amelia Boone or Claire Gallagher, they don't want the, they don't care. They don't want it. They just want something that's a lot more holistic, 
um, without the metrics. Um, and then you look at maybe someone on the other end, extreme other end, like Andrew Skirka or someone in the middle, like Keely Henninger, who's, um, you know, they want enough to kind of be able to see their, the change over time. Um, so yeah, it varies a lot by the athlete too. All right. And Ian? Um, I think we're all actually in a similar kind of response here. So I, I would say the main way that it's useful is particularly earlier on in training to, to be able to just make sure things are set up well. So um, to make, make sure the easy runs are easy enough, the hard runs are hard enough, and also to some degree maybe to be able to monitor recovery as well. So it's more um, to help guide the inner feelings of, of how to judge effort and intensity than to be the kind of thing that in a workout you're saying, oh, my heart rate's two beats too high, I've got to take it down, or now it's too low, I've got to take it up. That kind of thing, I think, is very uh, counterproductive. And actually, uh, just even monitoring things to that degree of, of uh, precision, uh, I think it's a false precision for one thing. And secondly, it can then affect how hard things feel. If you're constantly looking at your watch, everything's going to feel harder. It's harder to get into a rhythm and be able to just judge things better and, and be uh, making the little adjustments through the in entirety of a workout or a race rather than having some external thing telling you. The other way that it can be a downfall if someone gets too reliant on it is on race day, what happens if things go wrong? It's, it's always important to make sure that you've got the flexibility to adjust things. Um, and that means whether it's your food, your pacing, anything else. So what happens if your watch dies or your heart rate monitor breaks or something like that? You don't want to be 100% reliant on it, even if it was the best way to do it. So I would say it's definitely a, a big caveat there that I think is mainly to help with just setting out uh, the kind of highs and lows of, of the of how intense things should be, and therefore to, uh, to to just refine things a little bit. But much of it comes down to ju internal judgment of effort, and that's one of the key skills for uh, for any runner, anyway. Well, let's take an athlete's perspective on this, and I'm sure you've all had this. An athlete asks you, one of your one of the athletes that you're coaching, perhaps asks you after three months of working with you or six months of working with you, how do I know that I'm a better mountain ultra trail runner? And, and so you've all probably addressed that question. And how do you talk to that athlete at that point? Uh, I'll start. I mean, it, it's, very, I'd say very simple that if you're not getting faster or finding it easier or have some clear way to show that you are a better runner, I mean, if you can't tell that, then you probably haven't improved much. So um, one thing, particularly with power meters, which are fairly new, is that people will say, oh, well, it's telling me exactly what my, uh, how much is actually being outputted from the body, and it's very uh, precise uh, and it's objective. But ultimately, if you have increased your power for your 10K or if you've managed to, uh, to be going at a faster pace for a given amount of power, you already know that from the fact that you can run a faster 10K. So it's not really adding to that a whole lot. And you can judge it just as well from, um, say, a workout where you're mimicking elements of that race style uh, and aiming to um, to just dial in what that feels like and make sure that the workouts are getting better. So I think it should be pretty obvious if you're getting better. And races are always a benchmark as well. You know, if you're getting quicker for a race you did last year or for a certain distance. Okay. Uh, so, something I could add to Ian's is uh, with the tracking, the way that – I think a lot of us actually coach athletes is there's workouts written and then the athlete usually reports my athletes report back to me on what they've done. And I feel like when you're getting that question three months into the training plan, there's some self doubt going on. There's some questioning that, and it's a, a, it's a kind of a confidence build back up. And that's where a coach is a great sounding board to show you where those markers are. And maybe those are performance metrics. So that kind of counters my initial response to false, but <laughs> being able to look back over the, the I call it spreadsheets and show where you did this workout at this pace or you got in this many intervals and the, your notes on there. How did you feel? What did that one feel like? And then being able to hold the runner accountable to the notes that they've made and see their own progress just in their own comments. So it just adds to that ability to answer the confidence question. Yeah, I mean, that two amazing answers. And when I'm asked that question, I take a little bit different approach and I just go straight and um, disagree with the premise of the question altogether when the athlete asks it. <laughs> um, because, so let's see what's, what's the end goal here. So an athlete's like, oh, am I 
let's zoom out. So I'm only focused on someone's long-term growth as we all are, but like, that's really all I care about. Not growth as a runner necessarily, but as a person and all that stuff. So if you're focused on, am I a better runner than I was three months ago? Maybe you are. And hopefully you are, honestly, especially when you start coaching. Um, but what about three years? What about 30 years? And um, so if you start playing that game now, if you let those performance metrics dictate what you're doing in training and how you feel about your training, you're setting up essentially a framework for conditional self-worth where I nail this workout or I am improving and my training is good and I'm happy as opposed to setting up something that's much more like, you know, I'm really liking running right now. I feel good about myself and that's progress. Um, because usually that will be what gets you to your maximum potential anyway. Um, so like my, the way I like to frame it is one, try to get the athlete to take control of how they perceive themselves in the context of their running. And then two, you know, we'll work at the margins of performance within that framework. So, um, you know, when we'll do some, some key workouts that they go hammer and all these things, but we won't like, you know, focus on the specific numbers that come out of it. And you know, I, I think the the big thing to remember is just with trail running in general, there are so many variables that go into it that we don't need that information. Like it's it's so hard to tell what is improvement anyway. Um, you know, is it your 10K time or is it your 100 mile potential? How do you know your 100 mile potential until you do like, you know, 10 hundred milers and average the result of them? Um so yeah, in other words, I try to try to get the athlete to step off that track altogether, which can be hard sometimes. It can be. I mean, you know, a lot of people are they're, they're paying you to coach them. So in some sense they're 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 in an indirect way paying for a product. I mean, they're they're paying for a lot of things and and people get a coach for a lot of different reasons. But certainly some athletes are are getting that coach hoping that they are now going to be a faster runner you know, period. And, and I definitely appreciate David's approach of saying, well, let's hold back here. I mean, what, what are you really doing this for? Where's the why in that? If we want to pull Simon Sinek into the conversation, you know, what, what's the why here and what's the, that bigger picture. And, you know, isn't it really just about enjoying ourselves, finding joy in what we do. And really, if we find joy and happiness first, success will follow. It's really not the other way around. None of us become fulfilled people because we want to race, you know, it's happy in the moment, right? But it's not lifelong joy. So, you know, I certainly uh, appreciate that, but uh, bouncing it right back to you, David, I remember, I think that this maybe was an interview um, post from Andrew Skirka, but it was definitely somewhere where this question came up, and, you know, either in one of his posts or somewhere. And, and I remember you reflecting on look at this segment or the, this, this route that you did some time ago, now you're running that with a lower heart rate at the same pace or at a faster pace of the same heart rate. Or definitely on an Andrew Skirka um, workout, you were talking about how him, he doing um, fast intervals and noting that without him even, him even thinking about it, his in-between was getting faster right? The rest period in the rest where he's supposed to be resting, he's naturally getting faster and faster over time. So clearly, you know, you are diving at least for an athlete like that, who likes data, diving into mm -hmm. those numbers and, 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 and showing, pulling up the mirror and showing some of those metrics to a person to show you're, you're getting better. Do you all have those sorts of things that you go to for those athletes who just keep pushing and they want to see numbers? So I, I pointed out David, so let's go to David first. Well, yeah, uh, just on that particular point, Skirk is a great example of someone who's famously quantitative. And, you know, for him, it's a it's been a gradual pro process over two years. Like if I had told him the in month three what I just said, he would have said, you are that is some hippy dippy BS. And that's <laughs> not what I'm doing. But if you go back and read some of his more recent posts on that subject, I think you'll see that. He's starting now. He's going back to low volume. He's thinking like, okay, where do I want to be when I'm 42, five years from now, things like that. So, um, you know, it, it took like a little bit of medicine at a time or whatever until he uh, he adopted that, though. I'm sure it'll be a struggle forever. Um, but that being said, like when an athlete does, you know, there is a, there is a certain element of, okay, performance matters. I mean, we are doing races. We are doing these things that put us out there. 
And um, while this that is admittedly hippy dippy BS, um, there's a certain and there is a certain amount of hypocrisy in it too, because you know these athletes are a lot of them are pros, they're racing, and it matters. Um, when athletes are looking for those sorts of things, what the the metrics I really like to go to are one like if they use heart rate, how where is their heart rate on aerobic efforts? Um, I don't really care about where it is on hard efforts, um, but can they run a little bit more efficiently in, you know, while staying aerobic or, you know, in between aerobic threshold and lactate threshold, like these gray zone areas, which I found really do correlate to, especially ultra performance where you spend, you just spend a lot of ultras in those zones. Um, the other one is, um, something as simple as like, um, you know, the, what we do focuses a lot on raising, improving running economy, um, and speed. So just essentially what type of speed can someone reach sustainably for even something like 30 seconds at a time, you know, something that does, isn't hard, isn't, doesn't introduce a huge injury risk or, or, or stress. But, um, if someone is able to raise their top speed, often that does correlate with some distribution throughout the rest of their zones. So, um, I find that's one that like no one will judge themselves too harshly if it's not that fast. Um, but it does give some, some good data and a good incentive structure for the athlete of, okay, I actually want to work on getting fast and not just mail in these intervals. And bear in mind as well that improvement means a lot of different things. David touched on it there, but it's not just are you faster in a given workout. It obviously does matter, you know, what you're training for. So you might have improved towards 100-mile fitness and regressed towards 5K fitness or vice versa, depending on what specific stuff you're training on. Or you might be better at hills but have got crappy at flat road marathoning because you've you've got that uh, – uh, that trade-off there. But also, even at a higher level than that, one of the first things that it's important to identify with any new runner that I work with is what are they trying to achieve? And yes, to some degree, it's to get faster or to, to you know, that, that's usually in there in some way. But often there's, there's other stuff that you can't really measure with a heart rate monitor or something similar to that, such as just getting injured less. And, and the thing that'll make the biggest difference to them getting better at running is being able to run consistently. So someone who gets a lot of injuries, and this is actually probably a good portion of the people that, that come to me, is they just want to be able to, to train for stuff and not be injured and not keep having these two months of downtime, knowing that if they do that, they're going to be fitter no matter what all the other details are. So the lower chance of injury, more enjoyment out of running. Sometimes it's that people are getting really overly stressed by their races and they're therefore maybe training too hard. They're not recovering well enough. They're not getting the balance with their work and their family life. So all those things are improvement as well that are not really going to be measured in metrics on a day-to-day -day basis to the same degree, but they would still come through from the fact that they're enjoying their running more. They would typically be getting better at running for whatever they're training for and that the whole process is therefore more positive, but it's not like there's one number or several numbers that you can put together that clearly reflect that other than I suppose, you know, if they're training for a big race and they've had things that have held them back that they can do that better. Uh, and another element of that, of course, with, with uh, long distance stuff is things like nutrition. And, you know, if they keep getting stomach problems, they turn up fit, but they get a stomach problem and that screws up their race. Turn, getting fitter that won't necessarily be the thing that fixes it. It's working through all the other stuff as well that isn't going to be there in the metrics to the same degree. Couldn't agree more. It's like the holistic runners that you guys are, like, we're all like referring to or talking about the mind, the body, everything working together. Yeah, I don't need to add much more to that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no data that covers all of it. And, and even a combination of things doesn't allow for every element of that. That's why it's important to learn the skills of being able to make those judgments along the way and have the right process to get there. Yeah. And, you know, I think, and we're all talking, like alluding to this, but data for its own sake, it can be extremely uplifting when it's telling you a story you want to see. Um, so, but I, what I care about is what happens when it starts telling you a story you don't want to see as much, whether that's aging or injury or, you know, just a stress at work or whatever. Um, so like, I like athletes to set up a framework. Okay. How will this be fulfilling for me when things are going, not going perfectly? Um, and it, like an over-reliance on performance metrics can be a little rough with that. Um, so, you know, that's not the performance metrics really do matter and can be used extremely strategically, but um, they probably shouldn't be used as like quantifications of self-worth as, as a runner, which is a really, like, it's a slippery slope to that for most people. Um, so I think like if you're going to use a metric, start being like, okay, wh why am I using this metric? How am I going to use it? And um, 
you know, really set ground rules, especially with easy days easy, um, because when you do start piling in a lot of metrics, it's really easy to kind of have it be a mission creep to every day ends up being trying to optimize these metrics um, as opposed to like getting them in the right spot. That's a good point, David. I like the like the relationship to the metrics. Like, what? How are you referring to them? And I, as you're talking, I'm realizing from the get go, I'm setting up with athletes the way that they relate to these metrics, so that they're not afraid to tell me if something's going wrong, and they're not afraid to say, "Oh, I only got three of the five miles in," or whatever it is, because then I or and then write in the comments that, "Man, I didn't get a good night's sleep last night," or "My kid had me up because they were sick." If they have some relationship to the metrics that, oh, coach is going to pull me back or coach is going to do this, then we're not going to get really anywhere. So if we can pull in the reality of just what's happening and have the relationship to the metrics that with with the truth of what's going on, then we can achieve more. I really I like the way you put it. It made me think about how I connect my athletes with the metrics right off the bat. I hadn't really necessarily realized that that's what I was doing. Let's obviously stay on this topic, but shift lanes maybe just a little bit. Um, one of the the key things that an athlete is is often looking at when when they're getting these prescriptions from you guys is that there are things you're working on. They may you may be working on some speed work, you may be working on hills, you may be working on whatever it happens to be, long long runs, getting longer all of those sorts of things and an athlete may begin to question and you in a sense have a job too to try to figure out which of those approaches or which approaches really are working very well of getting an athlete towards their goals and making them better. We alluded to this actually in the last episode, but we know now there's a lot of research in the weightlifting community coming out talking about these genetic predispositions of people to gain equally in strength, two different people gaining equally in strength where one person is doing much higher intensity, lower reps, another person doing much lower intensity, higher reps. The workouts are very different, but each person is requiring that that difference to get to optimize their strength increases. And you know, we're kind of questioning now, is that going to play out actually too in, in other in a more endurance type events. And David mentioned in the last episode, something about where um, some athletes might actually benefit from the shorter, higher intensity workouts, even for endurance performance. And whereas other athletes wouldn't, and, and they need longer and slower, perhaps. How do you dial that in for somebody? How do you find those niches for somebody? I think part of that is getting to know the the runner well enough and delving into what's worked for them in the past. And also, helping them understand if they thought something was working for them, was it actually doing what they thought? So for example, sometimes I work with a lot of people who have, uh, you know, jobs where they're using a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of numbers, bankers, that kind of thing. And, uh, and typically they, they just want to be all about the numbers. They want to say, well, if I hit this and this, then that's going to get me, uh, to, to why, but ultimately that's not, not always going to be the case. And it's why are they using say heart rate as their measure? Why are they, always wanting to hit a certain amount of power. And is that the thing that's actually the most determinant of, of where they need to be? Or is that something that's actually potentially holding them back? So their, their relationship with those metrics is, is very important. And getting to know them in the first place and understanding what's worked for them in the past. And well, the difference between what they think has worked for them in the past and what has actually worked them and kind of digging that out to get the most from it. Because everyone is a little bit different, as you showed with the, the powerlifting example there. It's not like there's one type of training. You do that. That's the best thing. It's unanimous. That's all you do. It's very much individualized of how your body will respond. So you want to have the information of how their body has responded in the past. You know, I'll have some runners who are used to really high mileage and they just don't seem to do as well on lower mileage. Some people who just nail it on low mileage and they, they come to me saying, should I be raising the mileage? Because then surely I'll be even better if I do more. And often that's not the case. It's, you know, what has worked in the past is a pretty good guideline of, of at least where to start from and in refining things for the future as well. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to kind of bounce this then you know, around to everybody else. But that brings us really back to that very spe- that topic of, of metrics. So how do you know what has worked in the past? What does it worked mean? 
talking to the person is a big part of that and and also seeing where they've had success and importantly where they've had failure in the past and trying to identify the the key themes in both of those cases yeah yeah and um just i mean so from my perspective um and i, I think for probably most of us for most people in a vacuum more aerobic volume is better um you know there's limits to that we're not talking about the outliers here at the outer li limits but most athletes will improve if they work on their aerobic volume over time while keeping their speed high um and that does require metrics right where they're talking about time you know ver time invert or mileage or or whatever um so i think mileage is a great place to start most people improve it, like increasing their mileage um, is like a pretty straightforward way. There's no substitute for the trial of miles when people are first trying to reach their true, perf true performance potential. Um, where that leads is in is very different things for different people. Um, you know, sometimes you'll have Zach Miller running six hours a day in the mountains um, without a watch, and other times you'll have you know athletes doing 70 miles a week, finding that that's perfect for them, or 40 or less. Or, um, but you know, there is some there. Like I think that volume is one metric that really does matter because otherwise there's really no um, calibration tool for how how much work you're putting in. Um, and the amount of work you're putting in really does impact how the body adapts physiologically. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the, the one ultimate truth I think of running training that everyone has found out is that there are no shortcuts um, to trying to like optimize your own personal volume. And that could be very different numbers, but um, you know, there's no such thing as a high intensity, like H hit, like H I I T high intensity interval training running program. That is the best option for an endurance runner. Um, there is like, you know, some hit principles mixed in with endurance principles might work, but um, not as the baseline. Yeah, I guess I would just add the, the awareness and the presence, like you've got to draw on the past of what we've learned about the athlete in conversation or just in watching their charts grow and change and shift as they go. Integrating the reality of life is a big piece in terms of what they're able to do. And I guess I would just use a different word instead of volume, it'd be consistency. I'm a bigger, I'm a big proponent of like daily. If you can get out for two miles a day, that's better than doing 10 miles on Saturday in my book. So that just that consistency approach towards volume, um, would be my, like my little skew on um, what you said there. Um, yeah. And just knowing, I guess, in, in my personal experience, just noting how, what I used to do in my twenties and thirties, is definitely changing and how I can run and perform and train and recover as I, um, just entered the 40s so being aware of that for my athletes as well that what worked in the past is a good guideline and then knowing that as we move into the future or we continue just in the date just being aware with what's going on right now and translating that into what we can do in our training and not just say well this worked before so it's got to work again like just making the shift to be like, well, you know, you keep getting the same knee pain. Maybe we need to throw in some more core work days or strength work days during the week so that that kind of goes away. Just because you used to be able to run through it doesn't mean you can still run through it. <laughs> and that's a really important point. It This worked before. And so it's going to work again. And, you know, you just, flags go up, don't you? When you, when you hear that, you're like, well, Rob, maybe it not. Might. <laughs> it might, <laughs> it might, but maybe not. <laughs> And that it brings gives a good guide for, for a starting point, though, and yeah. then you're optimizing for yes. their current situation. So exactly. it's asking yeah. what's changed, such as being older, uh, having kids, living in a different city, uh, being at a high, high altitude yeah. job. Or it, it's optimizing it with with those things as a uh, a starting point to then allow for the other factors as well. And there's a timing factor here too, right? So if somebody has said, "Well, X sort of training over a few weeks." really seem to make me a more powerful runner on uphills. So let's do that again. Well, did you do that little block? Was that, are we talking about last year? Are we talking about the last three weeks? You know, are you maybe plateauing now? You can't just continue to do the same thing forever and expect it to continually make you equally better week by week, right? We need to change things up. We need to change the system. And so in the idea of 
performance metrics, measurements, looking at outcomes and and becoming a better runner, whether it's being more fulfilled as a runner because you're enjoying it more or whether there are actual outcome measurements, we want to know when it's time to start shifting the plan a bit because what you're getting out of it is what you're plateauing. Do you use metrics to demonstrate that? Is it still very much how the athlete is feeling? How do you identify those times where they're not getting as much gain as they were before and it's time to shift? I always tell any runner that that the main thing is if they feel they're not seeing improvement in whatever way that may be, getting faster, feeling better on the long runs or whatever, if they feel like that stopped or they're regressing, that's big alarm bell. I mean, it's not like every run is better than the previous run, but if you look back over the past couple of weeks and you're training hard and you're injury free, if you're not seeing some form of improvement that's obvious to you, tell me immediately so that we can work out why that is, what we need to change. Have we done too much of a certain thing? I, have you just had a couple of really busy weeks and, and it'll be fine to continue doing that next week? So I, I, I basically ask for the feedback. I mean, that ongoing conversation, there's really nothing that you could get purely from metrics that's going to tell me that to the same degree as someone being able to give me the context around everything. I keep trying. I, I keep the workouts and the weeks changing week over week and then also building in a recovery week. So I, I, I think in the way I design plans, I'm trying to avoid a plateau at all times. I mean, the reality is, is as training comes, it, each body's going to respond differently to it and there's adjustments that have to be made. I feel like if anything that ends up like shifting all that is just how life factors in. And so I might have this best laid plan to get them from now till September that gets them ready for their 50 miler. But then like this vacation pops up and then they get proposed to, they get married. And then all of a sudden this whole plan is so different. So, um, I guess re- life a lot of times avoids that plateau for an athlete or, or creates the plateau because they can only stick with the kind of mileage or workouts that work in with that kind of schedule. Definitely. Um, so for the, I mean, I'm sure that there's going to be some very quantitative people watching this that um, probably poo poo some of this. I mean, I think the way to really think about this for those people is that running progression, it has, more variables that you can count. Let's say let's say it's a 300 variable system. If you could isolate them all, um, and it's uh, nonlinear effects on each of the variables. So each of those 300 variables then has let's say 15 different um, things that are pushing on it. And so you do the math on that, and basically we're looking at a system where it's it's chaos theory. Um, you you have the butterfly effect that a butterfly flaps its wings, a hurricane ends up in Miami. And who knows how you got there? You can guess, you know, you can form patterns over time, but you can't isolate variables and predict it exactly. So you can create weather models that identify patterns. You can't predict the future. Um, And so what does that mean for what you do in the present? It just means trying to find the patterns that are predictive for you. Um, And I think probably what the skill of Christy and Ian is, or, or, you know, master pattern recognizers. Like they see things and don't even realize exactly what they're seeing and develop it. And probably every great coach has that same, that same trait. Um, so, you know, some of what we're trying to explain here is probably like, I know it when I see it, which is probably very quantitative in practice in their heads. Um, but, ne- but if you try to quantify that for every person, you're going to end up predicting a sunny day in Miami when actually a big hurricane's coming. Um, so long story short, the, the variables that most, that will be predictive for most people kind of like time of year might be for hurricanes and like weather conditions in the ocean and off, um, East or West Africa would be something like, what is your heart rate at a normal everyday flat, easy pace? Because you can control variables there, right? Like it's the same temperature. You're feeling the, you know, everything's kind of similar in your training cycle. You're rested, whatever. Um, if you start to see that the same pace or, or whatever is, is really going up in heart rate, then there's a big issue or conversely going way down then you have a big issue. Um, if you see holding steady or, or decreasing, you're probably in a, in a good spot generally. Um, and then all the other things are get so complex and athlete specific that trying to create like a generalized prescription is, you know, it's like trying to create a hurricane model where you have like, three different variables. I don't know, maybe they had models like that in the 1920s or something. Um, that, that we just don't have enough information to to get enough 
in, to get enough quantitative data to predict, to either prescribe things or predict things. And it's not just that, it's also that some of those things are inherently judgment-based. They're not purely objective, they're subjective. So asking someone how they feel, do they feel tired? It's very difficult to say, well, there's one metric that will tell you exactly what the answer is of how well recovered you are. There's several things that can, can indicate towards it and, and certainly worth maybe looking at those, but not treating any one of them as definitive. Um, and again, putting everything within the, the wider context and using that judgment and also trying to help the, the runner to improve their ability to judge things themselves because the coach isn't there at mile 10 of the race. The coach is having to teach them these skills to make those adjustments both in the middle of training runs, in, in week by week, uh, they have to make little adjustments here and there for themselves in their daily life. So being able to improve that interpretation of all of that data and, and, and understanding how they feel and what that means is a bigger part of it than just understanding any one or two things. And like David says, you know, there's obviously a lot of complexity there. So your internal judgment of things is what we're trying to improve uh, as we're coaching someone. So they can do those things better themselves. You're so right. And um, you, this brings up the point that both you guys made right off the bat, um, is the perception of things. And it, it's, it's also has a quantitative impact on how someone adapts to training. So while we're, while we're talking about like how you feel about things and all that, that actually has a massive um, effect on how you adapt to the stimulus. My favorite example that I've seen a few times is when people will have... Um, like sometimes there's GPS dead zones. So let's say a track that tells you you're going faster than you are. Um, there's one in San Francisco in particular that is pretty famous for that. Or conversely, something like um, you, Forest Park in Portland or somewhere like that, that underestimates how fast you, it like, cuts off some of the mileage. I've seen people that will train on the fast track that tells them they're going faster than they are on their watches, improve more because the metrics are telling them a story they like and why that happens, I don't know. Um, but it's very, very interesting. Whereas the people that have the slower runs have more of like inertia to get over and it don't speed up quite as much as expected. Um, so that might show a little bit how you control things. I and mean, how the brain plays into all of this really might be the most important part of training um, because our, our physiology, our aerobic systems, our musculoskeletal systems operate a little bit more directly than our brains do. And so, and um, when we're talking about like controlling the narrative with our metrics, maybe what we're actually talking about is controlling how our physiology actually adapts, you know, essentially harnessing the power of the placebo effect, not to sabotage ourselves. The power of the mind, false to power metrics. Yay. Thanks, David. <laughs> you got the word placebo in there. I was hoping I was going to be the one to drop it <laughs> after you were saying all that, but you're, you're absolutely right. The placebo effect is real. People, people often think about the placebo effect as, um, some of the sort of synthetic or not real, but it's just as real as anything else. It's as real as the drug. That's the point. It's, you know, we don't understand how it worked, but it worked just the same. And, and you're so right that when people have very positive views of what they're doing and they're happy with what they're doing and they think what they're doing is working, it really plays out that way. They do adapt better. They do get faster. I mean, there is real there, there are, would be measurable outcomes within that mindset um, for people. And then the opposite works too. When people are not happy, grinding through things, they may be getting the work done, but they generally don't adapt as well as the person who is themselves in a happier state about everything. And that's a staggering thing. And we see that as wishy-washy. I mean, Ian brought up very much the the perception issue. And I know a, you know a lot of athletes who are tethered to a single metric like a heart rate, you think of things like perception of effort as being a squishy number. But the truth is that we just have to dial into it. It's just as hardcore and rigorous and physiology-based as a heart rate number, whereas heart rate is a single number. Your perception of effort is your brain's integration of the tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of very specific real measurements that your body's making. And we, but we have to really practice that and dial into that. And that takes, that takes time. And, you know, and I, I love what all of you are saying about working with your athletes to find that because it, it is in the end, 
its own good metric. And that's all, you know, really, really important. One of the things that I think about when I we talk about consistency, as Chrissy brought up earlier, is, you know, when, when evaluating how well a type of workout is benefiting an athlete, how do you parse consistency of training and novelty of workouts from the specific features of the workouts? So, so like, in other words, how do you know that it's the workouts per se that are working for an athlete rather than simply that they're being consistent and you're giving them novelty once in a while? Well, they're both equally important. Uh, you can't have one without the other. If, if you just do the same route, the same pace every day, you're going to have a lot of consistency and you'll probably see some improvement, but not, you're not going to get as much bang for your buck. And equally, if you're always changing things up, you might be straining the body in too many different ways, or you might be straining it in ways that aren't as specific to what they're actually training for. So I would say it's, again, it, it, some of these sound like kind of wishy-washy ideas, but like you mentioned there, the idea of perceived effort, the idea of general improvement, these are things you can, you can judge as an, a kind of overall score for everything when you're factoring in all the elements yourself to see how it is rather than going on at any one metric. And I think that that's a very difficult skill to learn. And it's something that every runner and, and every coach continues to learn. It's not like you get to a certain point and you can just do it and you've nailed it and that's it. It's a continual learning process. And that, I think, is, again, uh, you know, like in, in any form of work or any, anything you're trying to excel at, it's not that you get to one point, you say, right, that's it. I've nailed this. I'm the best I can ever be. There's nothing more to learn. There's always going to be more that you can do, and whether that's new research coming out or whether that's just more experience from racing and training that you can factor in and you realize that something before that you thought was working is actually another element that was making that work. So it's very difficult to nail down and say X led to Y when there could be 20 different things that led to that, that success or failure. I'm with you. <laughs> that in. You know, and I'm in a lot of what we're saying here, despite how much truth there is to it, I still feel like there are probably a lot of athletes out there for whom that isn't satisfying enough, <laughs> you know? Well, people want to be able to measure things. They want to be able to say definitively, I have got better. And, and that's where I think races come in. That, that is the only way you can really do that because particularly, let's say, for the really long stuff. So in a 5K, it's a little bit more obvious. You know, your 5K time goes down just through being fitter. In the longer stuff, this is where all those other factors are coming in. How well can you manage yourself in the race? How well can you um, judge your pace? How well do you eat? All these other things that are not just how fit are you on the start line. So if you can improve your ability to do that, you have improved. It may be that your VO2 max, that you, you get that tested and it's lower, but you race better because you've got other things that you've improved to make that entire bundle more effective rather than any one part of it. So for, for those people, I say it's great. Yeah, your VO2 max went up or your heart rate's lower for X or Y. Or We see this in, in any major race. There'll be a whole lot of people listed on papers. Oh, well, this is the fastest person. This is the second fastest person. And the, this is how they'll finish. But in a really long race, that isn't the order they finish because of all those other factors and those other skills. So I think it's, it's saying to people, it's good to have these metrics and use that as part of it. But bear in mind that fitness isn't the only element that's going to be important here. Yeah, it uh, shows up more and more in ultras. I think that's why I love them. And I think uh, that's why it's so sus like a sustainable sport if you can work and figure all those things out because there's always a factor that's changing. There's always something you have to be aware of. There's always something you can learn. So it's a sport that there's, it doesn't just show up on paper and say, Ian's going to win Western States. Like there's going to be a lot of things that Ian has to do to make that happen on any given year that he lines up. And just because things worked out one year that doesn't guarantee anything in the future. Yeah, Sean, and I find that um, the people that do feel that way, I mean, it's one, understandable, and two, they often are as predisposed to that line of thinking as other people are to other things. So I often find that they're, let's say, financial analysts or business school graduates or, you know, that sort of, that they come from some background that makes them want to put, um, you know, A, B, A plus B equals C and get to that place. Um, but, you know, I think what I always try to do with them is one, they probably didn't reach out to me for coaching to begin with, um, just knowing like the, what I say and stuff. But um, two, you know, 
it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how adaptations to endurance exercise work. Um, and so that's where that chaos theory stuff comes in is like, you know, I'll get on the phone with them and describe the, you know, whatever I can, the basics of, of some of the theory behind how that works and how that applies to physiology in particular, um, which are, you know, closed systems, but have so many variables involved. Um, and, you know, at that point, if, if there's like an impasse reached, I think that, you know, sometimes some people actually find discrete, like not discrete, actually just find joy in the numbers. Like that is the end to them. It's not that they need to get faster in races, it's that they love the data analysis and things like that. And then I'll say, go ahead, let's, let's just, let's play with it. Let's see what numbers come out. Um, because that's like a slightly different game where, where people, I mean, I'm sure we all have had athletes like this of people that just want every single metric they can possibly find without really any particular meaning behind it. They want to make graphs. They want to do these things. It, it is part of the joy. And I won't, I won't stifle that joy if that comes out. So I think like, it's about understanding like who you are as a person. Will these numbers lead me to a happier place or a less happy place? Not just a faster place or a less faster place, because I think that either approach could work. Um, so that the, the fulfillment question matters more. And I can totally appreciate this. From my previous life as an economist, I was building financial models and things like that. And so it's basically about what are the variables? And then you're tweaking them and working out different scenarios. And you're trying to work out which are the most important variables. So if some small thing changes, but it doesn't really change the outcome, that doesn't matter as much. So we don't focus on it as much. That's the kind of mentality to try and impress upon people who are really numbers based is saying, okay, well, we can look at numbers, but we've got to identify which ones are going to have the biggest effect, which for, for that person personally for what they're training for and which ones really don't matter as much. So, you know, if you're training for a hundred mile race, it doesn't really matter how fast you are on the 5k. That's not going to be a big determining factor. While if you're training for a 10k, that's going to be a great metric of, of how, how, light, how well you're likely to do. So it's trying to identify all the information out there and which are the imp most important parts of it and getting them to buy into that. Because that's the other thing. If, if, if someone you're coaching doesn't agree with the way you're doing it or they, they're kind of nodding and smiling but thinking, well, I'm going to do it my way anyway and I'm going to ignore that piece of advice, then that's useless to everyone. So it's making sure that it's something that fits in with the way their brain works and the way they learn and improve, but that also isn't just playing to that for the sake of it and is thinking, well, okay, if we want to use numbers, this is one we can measure and we want to improve that as well as other stuff. So it's not the definitive thing, but let's use that as a kind of a rough benchmark and, and, and track it along the, along the way. So Sean, I'd be fascinated to know how you approach this as a coach, um, given that you know, you're one of the foremost experts in the field in this exact area we're talking about. And um, I imagine that when athletes are do reach out to you, a lot of them are along the, those lines of thinking. Like, so I know your perspective on these things mixes everything um, in, in a great way. It's why I love trying to, why it's why I think, you know, I try to recommend as many people as possible because you're such a great coach. But, um, you know, I, I'd be curious how you respond when in those situations and, and how you handle it. Yeah. Well, the first thing that's that I, one of the many first things that I you know do with an athlete is, is ask them what their goals are. They're short, they're very short-term goals. They're very long-term goals. What are they trying to achieve? And more specifically, what do they hope that I can do for them? And so when, when an athlete then comes back later and, and asks, how do I know that I'm on track or how that I know, do I know that I'm, I'm getting better? That's, we just go back to revisiting that. We go back to revisiting that. And I say, well, these were, here were your, your goals. Here's where you want to be as an athlete. Is that still holding true? Is that what we're looking? So I, in other words, I drill into what are they really asking in the question, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then once you identify that, then I think I approach it in a, in a way that melds a lot with, with what all of you are talking about. If, if they say, well, I want to know that I am going to be faster on this kind of terrain for this specific race this year, then I say, okay, well, let's go find some data in what you've done, because I am a data guy, that shows, shows you some of that progression and identify that. Or in some cases, maybe identify that, you know, hey, maybe we can be focusing on things a little bit differently. But at the same time, David, I always bring things back to exactly what you're talking about, because I think you also know that just as much as I'm a data guy, 
I'm very much a feeling guy as well. I mean, and, and my, my point being that with my story and, and history of, of depression, um, you know, happiness to me and joy to me is something that I think I probably wasn't until, until I was about my 40 years old before I realized that that is what's most important in life. Um, you know, I went through life. The whole reason I got a PhD is because it was the, the best. That's as high as you can go. Right. And, and so competitive in all ways for me, from being a soccer player to an academic. Um, and it was only in my forties, early forties now that I've come to realize that the only person I really need to make happy is me. So I try to bring that back to my athletes as well. Then satisfy that need for them to see some data, but also help them to recognize that while the data matters in that moment, it means nothing in the long run. That's so great. Thanks, yeah. thanks so much for sharing your story. And, you know, the way you balance things is really inspir- inspiring. So I appreciate well, it. I appreciate that from you. So, yeah. Re- yeah. Oh. I was just going to say really quick, a really good reminder that a lot of coaching is bringing in our personal experiences and what you shared was awesome. Yeah. So to pull it back just a little bit, and as we begin to, to wrap up, Ian, you've this is episode's going to come out after Western States is done, and and after you know you're carrying home the cougar, I'm, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and very be, much, if, if that's true, that'll sound awesome when it comes out. Yeah, All right. <laughs> so the best part, this is actually the Monday after Western States, and he already knows. And he's yeah, just I already like, know. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're, if only <laughs> we're fooling. So good luck for for one. For two, I want to ask you, you've been, you've done some heavy weight vest hiking. How did you assess whether that was benefiting you versus whether you would have been better off doing some other sort of training in that time? No, good question. I mean, I, I would say the main way is because I, it was something I used when I was coming back from an injury. So I couldn't run. I couldn't use as much force on my feet. So I could hike and hiking was fine. So I thought, well, if I'm going to get benefit from hiking, let's make it a little bit tougher. Let's get a bit of strength work in there. Now I tend to find, and so it, I, that then led to more success. And it's like, oh, this is a good thing to include. I've then seen that with a lot of other runners as well. But the main way that I've found, mainly through just refining things with myself and, and the people I coach over time, is to use weight vest hiking as a form of active recovery. So rather than just doing it as really hardcore mountainous sessions and you're trying to hammer your legs and do a really hard session, it's more in addition to the running they're doing to make it help. Well, firstly, just the movement, but without the pounding is helping a little bit with getting the blood flowing around and helping them recover and get more benefit from the other training they're doing. Plus, it's just adding a little bit of regular strength work. Like Chrissy said, she'd rather have people getting two miles a day than 10 miles at the weekend and nothing else. Kind of the same thing with just a little bit of weight vest hiking on a regular basis is adding that little bit of extra strength work. And realistically, and this is probably the, the, the thing that's most useful, this is something that a runner can do and they will commit to. While if you tell them, here's your strength workout, go to the gym and do it, it often doesn't happen. So doing weight vest stuff, they're thinking, aha, I'm walking. This is more like the thing I'm training for. So it's, it's not just the, um, the physiological benefit of it. It's the benefit of it being uh, sustainable and that they're going to fit in more consistently. Great. I think we've covered this topic pretty well. Do we want to have any, do we have any final thoughts, anything you haven't um, said that you'd like to say that we want to get out and to wrap this up a bit? So the one thing I wanted to mention for people watching is that one, one like area of metric quantification I think is pretty much universally helpful are blood tests um, and just understanding how your health in, in a really, in a really good way. I mean, that's something that lets you monitor how your body responds to training over time. Um, so you know, there are like health related metrics that can be really helpful and knowing what you're looking for, you know, not caring too much about some things Like you do, you know, especially female runners want to monitor their iron and, you know, for all runners, vitamin D is often way lower than the general population and things like that and understanding like runner related ranges, but those sorts of metrics can actually be a really good proxy for how the body is absorbing training and whether you need to recalibrate things or you recalibrate your nutrition or, or things like that. So, um, yeah, that this metric game isn't just on like how fast you run or your heart rate. It's also what you're doing when you're not running. Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, I think some of the fun stuff 
is, is not related to running, but related to how your body is handling the running outside of that. And my, my one last thing would be, um, I think the metrics are most useful, whether it's blood work, whether it's uh, heart rate or whatever, to make sure that you don't make mistakes rather than for fine tuning things when it's going well. So it's not about should you be at 150 beats or 151, it's more to make sure you're not at 120 or 190. So it's, it's to avoid the big mistakes and, and just to help refine things and help improve your ability to judge roughly how things should be. And if you've got, if it highlights that you've got vitamin D deficiency, then you're learning that, but you wouldn't have learned otherwise. While if it highlights you're in the mid range for vitamin D, uh, but it could be optimized by having 1% more of it, that's probably not the way that it's going to be most beneficial. I heard a, it just came up as you guys, we were talking about this last little bit. Um, a triathlete, when she was speaking to a group, that being 1% overtrained is worse than being 10% undertrained in terms of performance metrics. And I was just thinking about how the impact of that overdoing it and as a coach being able to pull an athlete back or maybe help them to not jump over that line. I feel like when I'm getting close to that 100 mile race distance, I'm walking the ridge line and it's either I stay on the ridge line or you fall off either side. And I guess that speaks to that same thing of the 1% over versus 10% under. And where that, the, where you can really benefit is that 10% under is where the power of the mind comes in. So can, knowing that you've done everything you can, you've taken the rest you need, making the plans that you need. So leaning back on those other skills, all those other improvements, aside from just how many miles you got in, that's going to set you up for a good, whatever it is, race, adventure, whatever it is that you're trying to get towards. Wonderful. Thank you all for, for carving out this time again. I really think we cover this topic very well. And, and honestly, I didn't know where this conversation was, was going to go because we're talking about metrics, you know, and, and it can go any sorts of directions with that. And um, I had this apprehension that we weren't going to come to any real answers. And while we didn't exactly, I really do feel like if I was an athlete listening to this, I would have some satisfaction and more so some comfort in realizing I don't have to hit these numbers exactly. And, and I need to think more about the holistic view of what's going on for many angles, many defini definitions of that word holistic. And so thank you for helping us bring that out for, for I think everybody that's, that's watching. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I love these talks. It's great. <laughs> great.